I'm Libby Burke. I'm the research librarian in the Bonneville Power Administration Library. I'd like to welcome you to our historical films. My background is as a film archivist, so when I arrived at BPA, I immediately gravitated towards their film program. I wanted to see what it was that they were doing, and it's fascinating to see. Now, government films have been made almost as long as any films have been made. So even in the 1900s, films were being made by the government. Thousands and thousands of films made by every agency. And if you had a public talk and you included a motion picture, you'd get way more people than you would if it was just a slideshow. Those were all passe by that time. And so film automatically became part of BPA. The first three films are made by Stephen Kahn, and he was BPA's first information officer. And he was a public power advocate as a student and actually left Oregon and went to Washington, D.C. to lobby for the Bonneville Power Act. And once that passed, he came back to Oregon and he formed the People's Power League and lobbied to hire J.D. Ross as the first Bonneville administrator. And when that happened, he came to work for BPA. Now, J.D. Ross was a great advocate of motion pictures as well. He was a great home movie guy. He made films of all of his gardens and all of his family, so he loved the idea of BPA making a film. Just a couple notes about the films that we have. I hope you understand that the condition of these films is not pristine. And the other issue that you will notice, cultural and environmental sensitivities that we have today are definitely not shown in these films. And you have to watch that kind of with that perspective. But otherwise, I think they're just wonderful and I think you'll have a really good time and learn a lot about BPA history uh, by watching them. So the first film on our DVD set is Hydro from 1939. It was billed as an answer to all your questions about hydroelectric power. What's going to happen to the fish? Is everybody going to get this power? Etc. Etc. They did brochures and they made this film and took it all around to the community groups in Washington and Oregon. <laughs> Stephen Kahn started to write this film in the style of the other Great Depression films, such as Per Lawrence's The Plow That Broke the Plains and The River. So it had great poetic narration over a beautiful and quite bombastic at times orchestral score written by William Lava, who later wrote for Disney nature films. And it was played by a symphony orchestra, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, which was actually a federal music project. And it was to put out of work musicians to work in symphony orchestras. But it was really to tell the local people the story of public power and why they should sign on. A lot of the rural areas or the, the small towns needed to sign up to cooperatives and public utility districts. And this film told them why they needed to do that uh, so that everyone would get the same low rate and the same opportunity. But it was picked up by Fox Movie Tone and it was shown all over the world actually translated into several languages and shown in movie theaters across the country as well. Uh, in 1944 it was taken overseas by the Vice President Henry Wallace who was on a goodwill tour of Asia and he brought Hydro to show how a democracy can still bring benefits for everyone. So this was a very successful film that went all over and this was something that had never been done before in the way that this was done. Our second film is called The Columbia, America's Greatest Power Stream. This was Stephen Kahn's motto. He used it over and over. He used it in the first film. He used it in this film. He loved that expression, America's Greatest Power Stream. So The Columbia was supposed to be a feature film length remake of Hydro. If you watch it next to Hydro or right after Hydro, you'll sort of have deja vu because there's a lot of the same footage. The narration comes back, the score is used again, 
But in order to make it more interesting and different for Stephen and for him to write another script, he decided that he wanted to do something with a folk singer. He had this idea that maybe there'd be a folk singer that would be narrating and standing on the top of a rock playing the guitar and singing uh, something in a folksy tune to make it really be a movie of the people. And he called Alan Lomax and asked him if he could recommend someone. And he said, I have just the perfect person. His name is Woody Guthrie. And he wasn't very well known at that time. He had made the Dust Bowl ballads on record. He had had some radio shows, but he wasn't very good at keeping those kinds of jobs. Uh, wasn't really big on advertising, didn't want to sing about the coffee company. You know, he just really wanted to do what he wanted to do. He was known as a troubadour. He'd gone around and, and, and followed the migrant workers, but he wasn't very well known and he seemed like the perfect person for this job. Uh, apparently, he got a telegram in California that said there was a job waiting for him at the Bonneville Power Administration and he was going to come up and travel around and write songs. So he piled his wife and his children into the car and drove them up to Portland and Stephen Kahn said, well, we don't really have a job yet for you. It was just kind of an idea that I was batting around. But now that you're here, let's see what we can do. Uh, because of his radical background, probably couldn't pass a lot of scrutiny if we had to hire him full time. So he brought Woody in to see Paul Raver, the administrator at the time, and said, you know, sing some songs for him and just kind of charm him. And that's what he did. And Dr. Raver said, well, we can't really hire you for a full year because it would just be too complicated and we wouldn't have that job now. But we could hire you for an emergency job for one month for $266 and that way we wouldn't have to go through any of this other red tape so that's what they did he had to fill out all the forms if you want to see them we have copies of them anyway he went around for a whole month and wrote 26 songs traveled around to the dams had a driver and came back every day to BPA and wrote a song a day basically down in the canyon and there you will see Grand Coulee showers her blessings on me. And then after that month was over, he just went back to New York. His wife and kids went one way, he went the other way, and he went back to New York. Stephen Kahn spent a couple of months trying to put the money together and finally got the budget to finish the film. So he went to New York and he got Woody into a studio and recorded a few songs that he decided he wanted to use for the film. Arizona, California, we'll make all your crops. Then it's northward to Oregon to gather our hops. Strawberries, cherries, and apples are best in that land full of promise, a Pacific Northwest. Stephen Kahn also went at that time to the United States Film Service, which was Pear Lawrence's company, and he brought a lot of stock footage of the Depression and of the uh, Dust Bowl, and he was going to cut all that into the footage of Hydro and then put in these folk songs. That was his plan. This was in September of 1941, by the way. So, of course, by the time he got back, just a few months later, Pearl Harbor. So, all of a sudden, we were in the war. BPA's energy of course turned to producing uh, materials for the war and Stephen Kahn went overseas and didn't come back until 1945. So this film basically sat as it was on the shelf. It never did materialize into the film that he had originally envisioned of being a remake of Hydro with these folk songs. And when he got back in 45 it was he didn't really even know what to do with that film. Um, so it just sat there and it sat there and it sat there and then in 1948 there was a tremendous flood of the Columbia River. It flooded the city of Vanport, and it was right at the mouth of the Willamette River and the Columbia. The whole town was wiped out. Everyone was left homeless. And Stephen Kahn, as soon as he heard about this flood, got some camera people down there. They filmed people coming out. They filmed the whole flood and the very, very uh, harrowing time for the people that lived there. The homes of 20,000 And suddenly he realized that he could put this 
footage together with and talk about flood control and then throw in some war industries and all of the hydro footage and the Dust Bowl footage and the Woody Guthrie songs and have a film. And that's what he did. He just wrote this whole other scenario. So you'll see about five different films almost in here kind of coming together uh, in an overall picture called Columbia, America's Greatest Power Stream. It was shown from 1949 to 1953. And after that time when Eisenhower was elected in 1952 and took office in 1953, Douglas McKay, who had been the governor of Oregon, was a staunch anti-public power person was appointed the Secretary of the Interior, which Bonneville was part of. So he now had authority over the Bonneville Power Administration, and he hated these films, apparently. And the story is that he gave an order, or threw someone in his office, to have all of the prints and the masters of Hydro and the Columbia destroyed, burned, and they were all called in from the field up at Ross, and they were incinerated. Um, nobody has ever found a copy of the order, nobody knows who got a phone call, but the order was given and these films were destroyed. Elmer Bueller was one of the people on the custodial staff that was ordered to do this. Now Elmer Bueller had been Woody Guthrie's driver when he was on his tour of the Columbia River area and he was a great public power person and always had been. So he saved a couple of prints of these two films and hid them for 20 years. One day a graduate student came looking for them and he said I knew somebody was going to come for these eventually and handed them over and now they are in the National Archives. We, there were about five, probably about 500 prints of the Columbia made so they didn't all come back. There are a few floating around and we have just done a transfer of one of the ones we found in our film archives. Um, it's not great, the sound is pretty good so it's probably the best transfer that we have. But that is the story of the Columbia, America's greatest power stream. Stephen Kahn's last film for BPA is called Highline, and it is the story of a transmission man. It is not written in anything like the style of Hydro or the Columbia. It's written more in a folksy, first-person sort of narrative, and definitely is a post-war film. It's the first color film, so it's beautifully made. There are shots of Paul Raver, who was our administrator, and Chief Engineer Saul Schultz is in there. Abraham Asipovich also, who is a transmission man himself, is shown talking to Schultz with this beautiful model of the transmission tower. So there's a lot of BPA people in this film and they get up in the airplane and there's beautiful aerial photography and there's a great tour of a Ross substation and an explanation of how substations work. It was really emphasizing the jobs that were coming and that we needed this transmission system and we needed to build more dams. So this film really does uh, end Stephen Kahn's era and when we watch the next three films that were made without him, we will miss his voice.